my pleasure to welcome you to our 7th annual YGL Summit. Uh, and for those of you who can do the math and know that we've only been around for 6 years, that means we've done more than one per year, but we still call them annual summits. Along with welcoming the young global leaders, I would also like to welcome our local Tanzanian guests who are joining you in each of your groups and up here on stage. Uh, we have over 20 organizations that we're working with today uh, that, that some of you as YGLs uh, are working with uh, already and, and kindly recommended to us. Uh, and we've spent a couple of weeks with them uh, going over the program and, and vetting and briefing and we're really, really glad uh, that they're here and uh, they're going to make a fantastic contribution. And so I want to thank those organizations up front for the time and energy that you've put in to this program to help us understand how you are empowering change and, uh, and what we can learn from you because I think we're going to learn a lot. So thank you very much uh, for being here with us. Uh, it's my pleasure for our opening plenary to welcome two distinguished guests, Dr. Salim Mahmoud Salim and our YGL Lawrence Masha. Uh, Dr. Salim has had a long and distinguished uh, career in international affairs uh, with the UN, with the Organization for African Unity, as an ambassador, but also holding key uh, ministerial positions here at, uh, in Tanzania, including Prime Minister. So we're very honored to have him uh, with us. And, and Lawrence, or, or Lau as he told me to call him, is uh, the Tanzanian Minister for Home Affairs. And if you don't know what that means, that means he looks after the police, the prisons, immigration, refugees, fire and rescue. So anything that could go wrong, this is the man who takes care of it. So. We're very, very glad not only to have him with us, but also to have him as a young global leader. He's, he's a lawyer by training, uh, got his uh, LLM at, uh, at Georgetown, uh, for those uh, Georgetown alumni in the room. Uh, he's also a businessman, he was uh, managing director of Tanzania Oxygen, a board member on Tanzanite One, and one of the founding uh, council members of the Dar es Salaam Stock Exchange. And uh, now he's elected Member of Parliament for the uh, Nyamagana um, um, constituency. And uh, so, uh, very interesting uh, background. And I know the uh, public sector leader uh, YGL uh, task force is going to be, uh, I'm sure, curious to, to talk with you more. So I'm going to hand it over to Masha to, uh, to give us some, some personal perspectives and some words. And then he'll hand over to Dr. Sutton. Thank you very much, David. And I take this opportunity to welcome all of you to Dar es Salaam. Uh, my fellow YGLs, it makes me proud to be able to say that for the first time. I've been given two tasks, and I must say that I am actually overwhelmed because when I was first requested by David to give an opening statement to the YGLs, I said, wait a second. Many of these people have been YGLs longer than I. They're more experienced possibly more eloquent than I, so I've been really gi been given a tough task. So if I fail, uh, it's not because of the fact that I haven't tried, but it uh, might be the fact that I'm slightly overwhelmed. And then to be put on the same stage as Dr. Salim, well, that just speaks words for itself. I've been requested to do two things. I've been requested, one, to introduce you to Dr. Salim, and secondly, to also give you a slight perspective of Tanzania by taking you through some of the challenges and successes which I've had during the course of my career path. Now, I've only been given between five and eight minutes to speak. And as you quickly heard from David, Dr. Salem's CV alone can take about half an hour to go through. So I'm going to cheat. Knowing that all of you are YGLs, have access to iPads, have access to Blackberries, etc., please Google Salim Ahmed Salim. You'll get to know him very well. And let me just leave it at that. What I could say is this, though, that had there been a grouping of YGLs in 1970 and 1980, Dr. Salim most definitely would have qualified.
just to give you a quick overview, Dr. Salim became Tanzania's ambassador to Egypt at the age of 22. By the time he was 30, he had been our ambassador to Egypt, to China, to India, and our permanent representative to the United Nations. By the age of 42, he was Prime Minister of Tanzania. He has since gone on to be head of the OAU, and currently is chairman of the Mwali Munyerere Foundation. Anything extra, go to Google, and put in Dr. Salem, Ahmed Salem, and you'll get it all. As you were told, my name is Lawrence Masha. I am the Minister for Home Affairs. I basically grew up in the United States. I came back to Tanzania for my uh, first law degree, an LLB at the University of Dar es Salaam, and then I went back to the US. I'm an attorney by profession, and as David told you, I later went on into industry. Tanzania Oxygen Limited is the equivalent to what some of you would know as either BOC or Afrox. And then I decided to go into politics. The reason I decided to go into politics was because of the experiences which I had while being one in the private sector as an attorney and also working for Tanzania Oxygen. What I realized during the course of my time working in these positions was that whenever we used to sat sit down in discussions talking about what was wrong with Tanzania, why things weren't going right, my group of friends, the people I used to hang out with, none of them were involved in government. But we all used to sit and complain and ask ourselves, don't these idiots in government know what's going on? Now, I hate to say that, I think now there are people out there who sit back and look at me and say, don't those idiots in government know what's going on? But what I came to realize was this, that many of us who had the opportunity, one, to have a very good education on our continent here, have had the opportunity to be successful in business. Many of us like to stay in business either to make more money, to get the the, the gratification of the cash, the good life, etc. But many of us don't actually wish to take part in working in terms of making policies, taking part in working in government at times where there is no great level of personal satisfaction in terms of monetary gain, etc. And I realized, wait a second, these guys in government are the ones who are making policy decisions. These guys in government are the ones who are making either life for us in business possible or difficult. But many of us don't participate. And that's why I decided to enter. When I entered government, I've been now in government for the past five years. I started as Deputy Minister for Energy and Minerals. I became Deputy Minister for Home Affairs. And now I am the Minister for Home Affairs. There are a variety of challenges which I did find. Some of the very challenges which I saw while outside of government, because I still look at some of my colleagues in government and say, where did they get some of these idiots? And you ask yourself, is this why things just don't uh, go the way they're supposed to? And what I've realized is that in order for countries like ours to develop, a country like Tanzania, and you'll be here for the next few days, one of the key things that is required at least in my view, is education and exposure. It doesn't suffice to just simply go to school and get a degree. That doesn't qualify one for leadership in positions of government. But you need a sufficient amount of exposure which allows you to understand not just what is necessary in terms of development, but you also need to understand how the rest of the world works and thinks. Because that's essential in this globalized world. And for many of our countries, that is one of the key factors which is missing. Especially because the best don't wish to go in to government. So you leave those who are less exposed, less educated, to be the foundation of putting together policy. These are the people who work together to set plans for your future. And in the end, what one has to realize is that even if you're in the private sector, no matter how well you do, these colleagues of mine who are in government have a clear effect on what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. 
One of the other things which should also be taken into account in terms of the question of education is that there has been a real change in the past 30, 40 years in terms of the quality of education on our continent, primarily because of the advances in technology. And we should ask ourselves how this is going to affect us in the future. If we look at Africa, let's say 30, 40 years ago when Dr. Salim was going to school, the main difference between Dr. Salim and a person who might have been going to school in London would have been maybe Dr. Salim might not have been wearing shoes and the quality of food they might have been eating. But the education was exactly the same. The most complicated tool a person was using at the time was a slide rule. The slide rule was the same in the UK as it was in the US as it was here. Yet we have the disparities in terms of develop developmental levels we have today. Now imagine what is happening as we speak today. A child in South Africa, a child in China, has access to a computer at the age of three or four. Are presenting papers by way of PowerPoint presentation by grade five and six. Whereas their colleagues on the continent, on the most part, don't have this access. Now we should ask ourselves, does this bode well for the future of the world as a whole? That the disparity which is going to be there 10, 15, 20 years from now is going to be much greater than that which was there at the time of Dr. Salim and his generation. I don't have the answer, but what I can tell you, I think it's actually more imperative at this time that the best, best educated, the best and most willing and ready to serve, actually now take part in the governmental process so that we can guide policy. So this big gap, which is about to actually emerge, if one can't say, it really actually already has, before it affects our future, I think there's something that needs to be done. I've been only given between five and eight minutes. Some people have been looking at me from the audience right over here telling me my time is up. I've been told we'll be having some sort of interactive discussion. So David, if you allow me, I'd like to hand over the microphone to Dr. Salim. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I am in a bigger problem than look now. I'm used to the UN experience. I'm used to the audio experience. And on both these forums, people start by saying, I'm going to make a brief, brief remarks. <laughs> and I'm going to stick to them. And what happens eventually, he goes, she or he goes to make a long speech of one hour. So I'll try to avoid that temptation. Let me start by saying, also by joining my colleague here, by saying how happy and delighted you all are with you here. Uh, it's an honor for Tanzania, mm -hmm. and I'm sure our people are more than delighted and look forward to interaction with you as you go to different parts of the country. You have brought with you, of course, a lot of rain it has its assets because the people in the, in, the, in the farms want this rain. But the people in the cities are not terribly enthusiastic about the rain. I hope you will not have to the, the pleasure or the, the difficulty of experience, experiencing what it is when it rains heavily in Dar es Salaam. I'll start where Marsha was talking about. I had the opportunity of serving my country at a very early age. At 22, I was ambassador in Cairo. And I'll tell you, it was not an easy experience. And I would not want to relieve that experience. I went there when most of the ambassadors, literally, none of them were below the age of 50. And I had this distinguished, very kind man from what is used to be called uh, Sri uh, Ceylon, now Sri Lanka. Every time I open my mouth to say something, when he refers to me, he says, as my grandson has said. <laughs> <laughs> the, the man was so kind, but I took exception eventually. And I, at some point I took him to task and said, Mr. Ambassador, I represent a sovereign country as sovereign as yours. 
which is which was really unfortunate for me to, to do that. But you know, that's this is the, the question of youth. But one other thing, I learned at a very early age that you need to have education. That education is absolutely an imperative. And so while I was in Cairo, when I went to India, which is my next posting, I was high commissioner. And for those of you who are not from the Commonwealth, you should know a high commissioner is equal to an ambassador. Though those who are commissioners always say a high commissioner is slightly higher than an ambassador. <laughs> I started, I did my undergraduate studies when I was in Colombia, well, sorry, when I was in, 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 in Delhi, doing the work of, a high, of an ambassador. Then I went to New York. When I became ambassador of the United Nations, I went to Colombia. So I was both a diplomat and a student at the same time. Fortunately, most of my professors did not know that I was an ambassador. <laughs> By the time they realized I was an ambassador, and I'll give you an example. There was a professor, a distinguished professor from Japan, who was teaching Chinese foreign policy. And here I was, in one of those days, there was another, another good friend of mine, Professor Mittelman, who was teaching contemporary African politics. So he invited me to go and talk about Tanzania-China relations. And I went there. Unfortunately, one of the people in the audience was Professor Ike. And so, after that, every time he was giving lectures, he would refer to me and say, what do you think, Ambassador Sarek? <laughs> it was awful. Now, I have been in the, I have been in, in, in I have occupied position of responsibility at a very young age and continue to occupy those positions. I have had the benefit of seeing how my country has evolved. Last month, we celebrated the, 20, the 46th anniversary of the United Republic of Tanganyika and Zanzibar, now referred to as Tanzania. In these years, we have seen a lot happening in Tanzania and a lot happening in Africa. Time does not allow for me to go through all that. But let me say one thing. Tanzania has been changing almost by the year. The situation at the time of our first president is different from the situation right now. But what has been consistent, whether it is the first president, the second president, the third president, or the current president, is the factor of the unity of our people. This is a country of more than 125 different tribes. In normal circumstances, if you allow the politics of ethnicity, the politics of tribalism to run supreme, then this country would have been long destabilized. But one other thing which has been consistent in this country is the recognition that people are first their national identity rather than their ethnic and tribal identity. So we have been able to have changes in the government, in the system. We started on a one-party state. For a long time we, were, we used to call ourselves a one-party democracy. We moved into a multi-party system. We've had a series of successions with the president being elected every 10 years, a new president. And no one in his or her right mind would ever contemplate to think that he can change the constitution in this country to be able to continue as president to switch in. So that has been one of the most important assets. So we have a system, yes, we have now, we have, the, we, we have sometimes contradictions, as we should, between the legislature, the executive, and the, 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 the judiciary. But throughout, we've been able to maintain that degree of cohesion and that degree of unity and the respect for, 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 the, for the country's laws. Don't be misled and think that Tanzania is a perfect place. It's not. We have our own problems, we have our own difficulties, but what I'm trying to say is that we are trying to resolve those problems with the support of the international community, working with the international community, but understanding, and particularly the younger generation, understands it even more. That really, yes, we need assistance from outside, yes, we need international cooperation, but the solution to our crisis is not only government, it's not only international partner, that they have to take the lead. And I'm very pleased to say that the, the, the likes of Master are many in Tanzania. There are many 
young people who have really taken upon themselves to provide service to the community and also to contribute the best they can for the development of the country. Now we have a number of crises. We have man-made crises and we have what we call natural disasters. We have problems here sometimes with drought. We have the major crisis of AIDS pandemic, which is really, the, 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 I suppose, is the most serious threat to the survival of our people than anything else. Because AIDS, as you know, knows no ethnicity, knows no color, knows no, no, has no geographical boundaries. Tanzania, like many other African countries, are, we are trying to, you know, to, to confront this, this, this pandemic. But it is a serious pandemic because it, um, above all, it affects the younger people, the most vibrant people of our society. We are privileged in this country that whatever differences we have, and there are differences, if you read the papers, and talking about the papers, by the way, we started in this country with one paper, government paper, party paper, workers' paper, and I think one religious paper. Now, my God, we have more than 200 papers. And mostly, mostly, they are private papers. Of course, like in any country which is developing, you have also some excesses. Some of our media people, media brothers and sisters, sometimes go to the extreme, write things which do not exist. Prevent, you know, you know they, they, if they want to, you know, to, to fix somebody, they can write all sort of things. But by and that, the dynamism of the press in this country is one thing which, are proud, which we are proud of. So in a sense, we talk in terms of consolidating democracy. And in terms of consolidating democracy, we have to consolidate institutions. And one of the institutions which is absolutely essential, of course, is the media institution. Let me say just one more thing, because my time is running out. Africa is confronted with a number of challenges. The challenges of poverty, the challenges of, the, of, of disease, and above all, the challenges of conflict. Tremendous efforts are now being made in this continent with an attempt to overcome this crisis. We have problems like the ones in Darfur. We have situations like the one in Somalia. We have crises like the one in Eastern DRC. But in all these crises, one good thing which, is, which I want to emphasize is that contrary to the said 20 years ago, the people who are leading the initiative to resolve this crisis are all Africans. Yes, with the support of the international community, but you name any crisis, and it's the Africans who are in the, in, who are in the forefront. So really, um, I am an optimist. You know, I, in, when I was in the OU, and going to Europe and going to America, there was a time when there was something called Afro-pessimism. People were talking in terms of, not, you can do nothing good for the continent. I can tell you, I am an optimist, and I believe what has been happening and is continuing to happen in this country and in this continent is something we are all, we are all aspiring for a better, a better continent, a better country. Finally, let me once again say how, how much of a pleasure it has been for all of us to, to be able to host you here. And I do sincerely hope that when you are here, you should feel free to ask anything to find out about it, whether it is a minister or an official or a political party from the opposition or from the government, you can talk freely because we are trying to build a genuinely democratic society. We haven't reached there yet. We haven't reached there yet, but we are moving towards that. Thank you so much. Great. Okay, well, we have a, a few minutes for questions, so think of your questions for either of our panelists. But I'm I'm going to start it off uh, to get things going um, with a question to uh, to Mao, which uh, I'm going to look to our, our public sector uh, leadership initiative. Um, who did a survey which showed that only six percent of the YGLs here uh, are are in public service. And uh, I'd like to ask you, what would be your advice to your fellow YGLs who may be reluctant to go into public service? Uh, maybe just a little bit about what you would what you would say to them. And uh, yeah, let's leave it at that. It's a very dangerous question. 
And I, I often joke to my friends and say that if I have a friend who wishes to go into politics, I'd advise him against it. If I had an enemy who wanted to go into politics, I'd borrow money and cap campaign for him third. Um, yes, we need to go into politics, uh, David. I, I think it's necessary. We can't all be in the private sector. However, one has to understand that uh, a political life does take a toll on you. You no longer have your own life. You open up your, your life to the entire country. And not only that, you actually subject your family to scrutiny which they might not be ready or willing to partake in. Uh, I'm the one who took the form to run for parliament in Yamagana, not my wife nor my children. Yet, my wife and children have also now been placed to a, in a position where they must also move to a higher standard. You can't necessarily always say what you feel. Gordon Brown learned that last week. <laughs> and if you do say it, you say it in what is a very private situation. As Dr. Salam says, without a microphone. Um, and so, I mean, what I'd like to tell uh, my colleagues is that uh, you really have to make a decision. Uh, it is a totally life-changing uh, situation. I wake up every morning, I didn't plan to be Minister for Home Affairs, but I'm responsible for the security for 44 million Tanzanians on a daily basis, and all of our guests who are here. If something goes wrong at the airport when you're coming through, that's my responsibility. If something was to happen to any of you, that is clearly my responsibility. I often tell people that uh, when my telephone rings, unlike when other people's telephones ring, when I see my phone ring at midnight, it's not good news. But in the end, someone has to do the job. If you're not ready for the responsibility, don't take the phone. Questions from the, from the floor? We get a mic for Arthur uh, Mutambara. Thank you very much, Arthur Mutambara from Zimbabwe. I want your comments on three new trends in Africa, or rather emphasis on trends. The first one is a paradigm shift from aid to investment, from aid to trade, where Africans are saying it's much more sustainable to concentrate on investment and trade in Africa as opposed to dependency on aid and donation. What is the Tanzanian experience on that one? The second one is the trend that says, let us move away from raw material economics to value addition, to beneficiation. Where are we in Tanzania on that one? The last one is the issue of regional economies, regional integration that says, Tanzania won't make it as Tanzania, they'll make it as Sadat, they'll make it as Comesa, they'll make it as part of the African economy. Where are we in terms of emphasis on regional competitiveness, regional attractiveness in Tanzania? Thank you very much. And I was trying to convince Dr. Salim that he should start uh, responding to that. But uh, let me say that First and foremost, when it comes to our position, positionings within regional groupings, it's clear that within regional groupings there is greater strength. But the regional groupings must be right. And I think one of the fundamentals which Tanzania has been working on is while accepting that regional groupings are necessary, both for economic and political stability, we've always had to make what we're making sure now is that the underlying factors which bring us together within the regional groupings, that these underlying factors are right. And what we've been saying to our colleagues, for example, in the EAC, is that we've had the benefit as Tanzania to know what it is to be in the union longer than anyone else. Because we do have the union between Tanganyika and Zanzibar. And we know the, the effects of rushing too quickly into a union without clearly thinking these things out. Today, 46, 46 years since our union, 
we actually have a committee which looks into problems relating to our union. Now, what we say, for example, within the EAC is that, yes, let's integrate economically. There are those who wish us to go, they say, into political integration, and we ask, wait a second, although it's not a bad idea, don't you think that we should all be on the first same page as well? We in Tanzania have had smooth political transitions since our independence. Are all of our colleagues on the same page? And what can we do to get all of us on the same page so that we can actually succeed with what we want? So I think that's where we are in terms of looking at regional integration. We clearly accept the fact that together we, we will be better. With regard to aid versus investment, there are times when aid leads to complacency. You know that you will always have some, a big brother there to bring you the assistance, but it does not mean that aid is not necessary. These, we are still poor countries. We still do require this development aid. However, what we need is investment. We need the capacity to also generate income and generate wealth ourselves. For our countries to be able to actually thrive, it doesn't suffice to have foreign investors come in and invest in Tanzania, create wealth for themselves, for themselves and leave. We also need to come up with a mechanism where we can create local wealth so your local wealth and foreign investment can work together. This is what will make a country wealthy. This is what will make a country powerful, not aid by itself. And I'll leave uh, the rest to Dr. Sam. Yes, two observations. One, it is a fact that we, our countries cannot continue to rely on aid. It's not sustainable. So, if you say what is preferred, is it investment and, and better terms of trade or aid, I would say clearly investment and better terms of trade. But in the meantime, as we do so, it's important also that we should continue to have the type of support that we are getting by the international community. Now, on the question of integration, let me say this very clearly. I think Tanzania or East Africa or Southern Africa or the whole of Africa at the end of the day has no alternative but to, us, to move towards integration. The reality of the world is such that even the, most, the more powerful countries in the world compared to the combination of our countries consider the importance of working together, promoting economic harmony, promoting economic integration. Take Europe, despite the fact that the problems they are having right now, but it is a fact that European countries have decided that it is in their best interest to promote integration. So we, who have been the subject of colonialism under European, basically European, European colonialism, have even more reason to promote integration, to promote economic cooperation among our countries. And I don't think it's a question of, of alternative. Anyone who really believes that he, a country can work on, so even the more powerful country, in this continent we have countries which are definitely much stronger. South Africa, Nigeria, and others. But the fact remains, even they, to have an impact on in international, the international arena would be very limited unless they work in, 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 uh, jointly with the rest of Africa. We have time for one, one more question from the floor. Over here, can we get a mic to Peggy? Hi, Dr. Salim. I'm Chinese American, and so I have a little bit of a confusion about Africa. My friends in America tell me that Chinese people, China, should be more involved in helping Africa with defense. Uh, and they say that we're exploiting, China is exploiting natural resources in Africa. Uh, my friends in China say that we have a policy of non-interference and that we're building communities uh, while 
exploiting natural resources. So um, I, I just wanted to get a point, a sort of perspective from an African. How is China doing in Africa? What can we do better? Well, I think first it's important to have a historical setting of, of this issue. Uh, when I was in, in New York, in Washington, some five years ago, and uh, was addressing a group of Congress persons and congressional assistants. One question which kept featuring, what are the Chinese doing in Africa? And I said to them, but gentlemen and ladies, where are you? The Chinese have had relations with African countries for quite a long time. And basically, you will find that in most of our countries, the impression about China is that because it goes on to reflect the type of relationship that these countries have had with China. Now, this is not to say the Chinese have no particular interest and interest of trying to get resources from Africa, oil especially, and so on. But is this interest confined to China? What about the other powers? What about the Americans? What about the Europeans? What about the others? So the question of searching for resources or trying to get resources is not something which can only be blamed with the Chinese. But clearly, what is important for African countries, and I can speak in terms of Tanzania's experience, is to determine what is also good for Tanzania. What is also good for Africa? Do the Chinese interest in a particular project Converge with the interests of the Tanzanians or Africa, or is it negative? Now, for the time being, I can say with some amount of authority, based on my own country's experience, that invariably we have found that the Chinese assistance has been positive in our country. The cooperation with China has been to the advantage of, China, of Tanzania, on obvious basis of the advantage of China. Clearly, it goes back to history also. History, the Chinese were very keen to have more friends in Africa. And it has wanted more friends in Africa, especially at a time when China was isolated. Don't forget, for a long time, China did not belong, was not allowed to belong to the community of nations. It was more or less considered as a pariah. That's a time also when China had some of very good friends and established very good friends in Africa. And so, on balance, I would say the Chinese, the Chinese African relationship certainly is a positive. Well, I think we'll, we'll wrap up the session there. Thank you, Dr. Salim. Thank you, uh, Mr. Maisha. Thank you for being with us. We're just going to re reset the stage, so I'll, I'll talk. I'll try and stand here and talk while they uh, move, the, uh, move the furniture. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. When we, uh, when we first heard uh, Penelope's story, from CAMFED. CAMFED is one of the organizations you're visiting today. Uh, we knew we really wanted her to join us as a speaker today. In her young life, Penelope is just 22 years old. She has overcome tremendous adversity and she's become a real leader and a role model in her rural community in Zambia. Penelope is going to share with us her odyssey about how she broke through the cycle of poverty and how she is inspiring change around her. Penelope grew up and lives in Santhia district, which is a, an impoverished area in the in north of Zambia, about 10 hours drive from Lusaka. It's a region of lakes, marshlands, and it embodies a lot of the challenges that many places uh, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa face. It has a, a somewhat fragile economy which is based on subsistence farming and subsistence fishing. There's a high prevalence of HIV AIDS, high unemployment and few opportunities for young people, and weak transport and communications infrastructure. And so even for us, when we were reaching out to Penelope, uh, it wasn't possible for us to get a, a good phone line and have a conversation, so we were literally passing messages through CAMFED uh, to get to her and to talk to her and to organize everything to have her here. 
But she's going to talk about what she's done and how she joined a, a filmmaking workshop that went on to, to make an award-winning film. And today, Penelope is managing uh, the first IT center uh, of its kind in the Sampia district where she is introducing hundreds of uh, uh, other young women to, to the vast potential of, of technology. And her story is proof that with the right model of change and good support, uh, a girl can bust out of poverty and give hope to an entire community. So I'd like to invite you, Penelope Machipi, up on stage and, and to thank you so much for being here. Economic Forum for inviting me to be here today. It's an honor to be in a room full of young people who are determined to create positive change in the world. I appreciate what a privilege it is to be among you all because there was a time in my life when I was cut off from all opportunity and I would like to share with you the story of my journey that has brought me to this stage today. I was born in a mining town in Zambia, and my father had a good job as a miner. But when I was eight years old, my father died, and later on a year, my mother died as well. My life became a constant struggle. My father's family grabbed all of the properties that my father left, leaving me and my siblings with nothing. My mother's sister took me in, but because she had eight children, she could not afford to pay money for my school fees. At the age of 12, I had to drop out of school. My uncle was a fisherman, and instead of going to school, I was helping my auntie to sell fish at the market in order to have food on the table. I stayed out of school for two years. And I would sit at my house and watch other children on their way to school, and it would really pain me. I knew a lot of young women in my community who had dropped out of school due to poverty, and I knew how they struggled. Some of them would end up getting married young and having a lot of children. Some of them would become prostitutes and eventually died of AIDS. <coughs> and I was sure that this would be my life as well. I knew that you cannot escape poverty without going to school. I envisioned a pen who would never stop suffering, and I remember writing down the words, sufferers never rest. I felt like I would be trapped in this poverty forever, and my life would always be hard. But my fate changed very suddenly. When I was 15, a charity organization called Comfort, which supports orphans and vulnerable girls through school, was introduced in my district. My auntie heard the news and she went to my former school to make an inquiry. She very much wanted me to be in school. And she described my hardships to the head teacher and after reviewing my case, a committee selected me on a scholarship. The day I heard that I was going back to school was the most exciting day of my life. I was so happy to know that my future would now be bright. I had been admiring my fellow girls who were going to school. I understood that education would give them opportunities that were out of reach for me. Education gives women a voice and empowers them with knowledge to make informed decisions. I was supported by comfort all the way through high school. They paid for my school fees, my boarding fees, my uniform, and all my books and school supplies. I didn't have to worry about any expense, and I could only focus on my studies. I'm telling you, it was a real turning point in my life. When I completed high school, I was trained by comfort to be a filmmaker. Along with the other 23 women in my rural district of Sanfia, we call ourselves the Sanfia Women Filmmakers. We produce films about sensitive issues that are rarely discussed in the community. 
Our first film, I found my way, told my personal story. We screened the film for more than 3,000 people in our district, and it opened up a dialogue about the vicious circle of poverty and AIDS. It was hard to, to share my story because I had to relive a difficult part of my life, but I decided to do it so that other people would blame. And they did. Since the film was screened, we have opened people's eyes to the way that AIDS orphans are being mistreated. We have tried to reduce the incident of property grabbing in the community. I'd like to show you a clip from a documentary about the Central Women filmmakers called Where the Water Meets the Sky, which captures the community's reaction to our first film. As the film draws to an end, the women sense an opportunity. Without prompting, they take to the stage one by one. So I don't think most of them will ever forget today. Most of them spoke so confidently. And it's all part of uh, what the whole filmmaking and uh, advocacy is all about. You know, build their confidence so that they confidently talk about contributing change attitudes. And I think it's really working. That was uh, very nice, you know, that film that you was. I want to thank you, you know, for being very brave. Because thank you for your work. Right? Thank you. With the success of their premiere, other screenings soon follow across Zambia. I'm proud because we want to make a difference. So even my fellow friends, they are proud. now made three films. We are using them to spark social change. Our second film addresses the issue of child labor. We plan to screen it in different parts of Zambia and to use it as an advocacy tool to end child labor. When the other filmmakers and I began discussing the focus for our third film, we realized that many women in Zambia are being abused by their husbands. But no one was talking about it. We decided we had to expose this problem and bring it to an end. It didn't take us long to find a woman who was being abused. And she agreed to be interviewed for the film. 
after we interviewed her, her husband changed his behavior very quickly. He's afraid to spend the film in the community and he'll be jailed. He apologizes every time he sees us. He has now become very humble and is doing some of the housework. <laughs> we filmed interviews with so many people, both men and women. We filmed from the government, the prosecutor, and from the victim support unit. While we are shooting, a lot of men in the community reacted. They were fearing us, if, even if we didn't have cameras. They would see us and say, these are the girls who are teaching women about their rights and exposing men who are mistreating their wives. We are hearing from community members that things are changing. Men know that we are shedding light on abuse and it is stopping them from mistreating their wives. We plan to spend the film in our community and other parts of Zambia to bring about more change of this kind. We also plan to screen the film in Parliament because in Zambia there is no specific law against domestic violence but just a law against assault. Our goal is to persuade Parliament to pass a domestic violence law. We want, to, we want women to be aware of their rights and know that no one is, uh, should be allowed to beat them. And if they are beaten, they can know where to report. I'm also creating positive change by making technology accessible to my community for the first time ever. Last year, I was chosen as a special scholar to receive IT training in the 10,000 Women program. Let's watch a short clip of how that program benefited young women. What we'd like to talk about now is just to find out what experience you all have in IT. They don't speak anything. Right. So, we, so, so the four, is that right? The four of you have never used a computer before? Yes. We have to start sort of at the beginning. Here's some computers, here's how you put them together. Here's how they work. Here's how you make your network of computers work. Here's how you connect it to the internet. Here's how you find out if something's wrong. There's a lot of cultural adjustments. There's lots of things we take for granted that of course they would have had no experience of. Before the beginning of this course, I didn't have any experience about the computers. We were just hearing about computers that they exist, but this is the first time I came across a computer using it on my own. We're working with a, a small group, um, a group of four young women, who will be running the resource centre after this, this training course. It is connected to the internet. Oh. Oh. Then that thing which, which you are seeing there, oh. where it is, that's where the position of the centre is. I think they're getting the right flavour or spirit of IT, that they're going to be able to fix things themselves, they're going to be able to find out things for themselves, they're going to be quite empowered by this technology, and hopefully through them empower a community um, with that same spirit. Yeah. Before, I never knew how to type anything on the computer, but today I've learned something, I think. You can also sell your goods through the computer. Yeah. Yeah, I would love to know how, how they buy, like, when they say, no, I bought this through a computer, I would like to, um, to know how they buy things through the process. Because uh, my item is sugar. How can someone get the sugar from the computer? Yeah. <laughs> Before the training, I had never touched a computer. Today, I manage an IT center in Sanfia. I'm teaching computer skills to as many as 380 people every month. I'm even teaching my fellow teachers who once taught me. It is inspiring for the community to have one of their own teaching them IT, rather than a foreigner, because they understand that IT is also a tool for us Zambians. There are so many ways that the IT center helps the community. It provides young women who might otherwise be spending time on the street or in bars to learn and grow. School girls who cannot afford textbooks are able to search online for their material and print them out. And those resources improve their academic performances. Having IT skills will help these girls build their futures. It will give them access to higher education opportunities and make them eligible for good jobs.
But the IT center isn't always a no play. It has become a place for young people to socialize, to listen to music, and to watch videos. It gives community members a chance to enjoy themselves because they need that in their lives too. I'm also mentoring young entrepreneurs in Sanfia who are using IT to develop their businesses. They are using the internet and mobile phones to research pricing and find suppliers. And it is helping them to run their enterprises more effectively. Finally, I'm linking some of the most isolated parts of Zambia to the rest of the world by setting up solar-powered IT centers. In remote areas like my own, the internet represents knowledge. For many years, we have been cut off from this knowledge. With these solar-powered IT centers, we are able to stay updated on world events and to educate ourselves about a variety of issues, whether health problems or job opportunities. It's like before we are blind and somebody has removed the cloth from our face and we are able to see what others are also seeing. All of you here are aware of the problems affecting poverty-stricken areas like my own. I know from a personal experience that the only way we can escape through this poverty is by education. When people in my community see how my life has been transformed, it gives them hope. I'd like to ask you as young global leaders to join me into turning that up into something tangible. As we are sitting here this morning, there are 115 million children who are not in school. This fact pains me because I was once in their position and I know how hopeless they feel. But I also know that it can be different. I'd like to call on all of you today to be part of the global movement to give all of those children the opportunity to go to school. They deserve, they deserve to be able to earn money to support their families. They deserve access to the knowledge that will keep them healthy. They deserve to send their own children to school. By giving those children this fundamental but precious opportunity, we will set in motion a positive circle of change that will last for generations. Lastly, but not the least, thank you all for your attention and for the important work you are doing to make the world a better and more just place. Penelope is going to be around uh, all week, so uh, if you want to talk to her further uh, about what she's doing, um, she's happy to, to answer questions and talk to you. Talk to you then. Um, I want to say a few words about the girl effect, um, because I think um, girl-focused work has been going on for decades, but it's only now that it's starting to catch the attention of global leaders. And I think we just had a great example of what the girl effect can do and what happens when you invest in, in uh, young women and girls and how now that offers us hope, it offers us results, and it offers a model that you can scale. So today, although you're all going on different learning uh, impact journeys and you're going to learn a lot, we've asked a number of people, about 20 YGLs, to be part of a cross-sector uh, girl effect team, uh, which is going to meet tomorrow. And, and those people who are embedded in all the different teams uh, are going to be, it's their job to be the protagonists for, for girls uh, on their journeys and to report back how investing in girls can hasten change. Um, and so that you also, in, in the different YGL initiatives and task forces, uh, consider how you might uh, integrate the girl effect into what you're doing. In keeping with that, you might be curious about your uh, participant bags and the story behind them. Uh, these were actually made by the Self-Employed Women's uh, Association of India, and we decided for the summit to use our purchasing power uh, to do something positive uh, and to, to find a way of empowering others. 
These are handmade and hand embroidered, and they brought work to dozens of self-employed women who are working to bring their families out of poverty. And we thought that given, given the long tradition of, uh, of exchange between India and East Africa was a nice, uh, nice connection as well. It's my pleasure now to introduce David Bonbright, our next speaker. And I know that many people in the room are very anxious uh, to hear what he has to say. Let me give you a little bit of context uh, about uh, why we invited him and why you're going on your impact journeys. Your, your presence here, and it's so wonderful to see this full, full room, is probably the single best indicator that the YGL community is thriving and that you feel that coming all this way and spending these days together is a good use of your time, is time well spent. And that, I think, is worth celebrating. So uh, congratulations again for all making it here. We're, we're very warm by that. But the mission of the Forum of Young Global Leaders is to shape a more positive future. And that mission challenges us to answer some tough questions. How do we achieve this mission? What actions should we be taking? How do we move from a successful network of successful individuals to a community of significance in the world? How do we shift from a community of shared values and strong friendships to a community of impact. I think this is the heart of our summit. Today's journeys will be a chance for you to learn about local change and how that's happening and how that can inform us as individual leaders and as a community of leaders. So the goal of our impact journeys is threefold. The first is to understand how these local organizations are empowering change. The second is to discover where our expertise and our experience might help these agencies to break through a barrier or to improve their own impact. And the third is to learn about their best practices for our own initiatives and our own personal endeavors. Our time together here is a good moment to ask if we are individually and collectively focused on the right thing and having the impact that we intend. Are there better ways to leverage the power of this incredible community? How are we defining our impact? How are we measuring our impact? How are we scaling it? If we want to talk about our return on impact or our return on effort, we need to talk about metrics and measurement. So that's what David Bombright is here to talk to us about. He's a great expert on planning, measuring, and reporting social impact. He's the CEO and founder of Keystone, with over three decades experience as a grant maker and a manager for many of the world's most preeminent foundations, the Aga Khan Foundation, Ford Foundation, Ashoka. And through that, he sought to evolve and test approaches and metrics to really empower our citizens to self-organize for sustainable development. And so I think you're going to find his remarks today challenging and fascinating and a good basis for everything that we're going to be doing over the next two and a half days together. So David, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that welcome. My voice is a little strained from talking over the music last night. Um, the first, the first thing I'd like to do is um, express my appreciation to WEF and to all of you for kind of welcoming, welcoming me into this house. It was clear last night uh, how much trust and warmth and friendship already exists in, in, amongst you. And uh, anytime you incorporate somebody new, uh, there's an adjustment and there's a, there's a kind of a learning process. So I look forward to being with you for the next few days. I'm doing a little stand-up now. I'm going to share some of my experiences and the kind of journey to understand impact. But I hope I can get to know you over the time that we're here together and, um, and kind of uh, partake of some of the love. Okay. 
Um, so what, what I'd like to do in the, in the brief time that we have together in this session is really try to share some of the history and background uh, that I've had in terms of coming to impact. And I have to begin with a con uh, confession, which is that I've been introduced as something of an expert in measurement. And um, if I am, that has to be because it's been self-taught. It has not been trained. I've spent most of my career um, as either a grant maker or a social entrepreneur. I'm a human rights lawyer by training, and my orientation really has been to try to build strong democratic civil society organizations, and that's what I've done. And about 10 years ago, I became obsessed with the measurement problem because I thought it was holding us back. And so for the last decade, I've really been focusing on measurement issues. And it's that last decade that's building on the prior two decades that I'm really sharing with you today. Okay, so <clears throat> first image, this is not a, uh, a uh, radioactive mushroom cloud. This is a volcano eruption. And a cloud of ash spreads slowly across Europe. It grounds air traffic for several days. Millions of people are stranded across the world. Now that's impact. But how can you measure it? Um, we can count some of the numbers. We know how many planes were grounded. We know how many people were, on the gr were, uh, were stranded. We know how many people lived in airports. We know how long they were there um, and what kind of supports they had. And we know stories. In the media, we heard stories. We know some of our own stories. I'm sure there's a lot of first-person stories about the impact of that volcano eruption. Um, um, but what do they add up to? Or is that the wrong question? Should we rather be asking, uh, what um, has this volcanic eruption started? What will it lead to? Will it change our civilizational confrontation with the natural environment? How will it change the way we live, travel, and communicate? What are the indicators that we can see today that are the best predictors of the future consequences of that eruption? So everyone in this room is a mini volcano. Um, as a community, you are another kind of volcano. Um, how do we begin to measure the social impact of each of you are having and will have? And I'm going to return a few times in my presentation to Penelope and her story, because she's helped make my life a little easier today. So thank you, Penelope. Um, because she's illustrated some of the points I want to make about how we can start to get to impact. So, really three parts to this presentation. The first, and then this session, the first is a, a kind of a short history and overview of the kind of uh, conceptual and historical context around impact measurement. Now, the second part, I'm going to try to actually uh, draw you all in a little bit, and there's a few people I'm going to, I've, we've, we've primed in advance, we want to call out to share some of their experiences in terms of trying to get to better impact measures. And then we're going to get very practical and talk about checklists and, and kind of practical uh, takeaways that you can maybe uh, use in your own uh, efforts to understand and promote impact. Okay, so um, this cartoon, for those of you who can't read it, is a bunch of wolves on a mountain howling at the moon and one is asking another, um, do you think we're having any impact? So. Uh, the point here is that, um, is that um, whether or not we can see the impact today of what we're doing, um, we have to be, we are going for it. That's the purpose. It's a kind of a purpose question. So the central question that we're really asking in our efforts to make the world a better place is are we maximizing total performance while generating lasting impact? Maybe it's two questions, because I pulled performance and impact together, but uh, they're inextricably linked. It's performance for impact. Um, and in the world of social change, in the world of coming together intentionally to do something good, which has for hundreds of years been characterized by what we might call good intentions, we're now to that point in history where good intentions just aren't enough, where we actually have to um, 
understand the impact and learn forward more quickly. And, um, and as we do that, we have to recognize thank you, that we're each standing in different places. And this is my first kind of meta theme from this conversation, which is to get to better ways to measure social impact, we need to begin to recognize that we're all standing in different places in relationship to it. So whether you're an entrepreneur or a citizen and a concerned citizen or a social worker or an investor, you have a different orientation toward understanding the measures, the indicators that we're using to understand what impact is happening. Fundamental point. I want to give a little shout out here now to Jed Emerson. This is his slide. And the first couple of slides I'm going to use are his. And we were meant to do this together, but unfortunately uh, he was pulled away and I'm a left turn on my own. And he was going to do the first part of this talk. Jed's really one of the world's authorities on thinking about uh, social value creation and getting broader ways and, and better ways to understand it. And um, if you don't know of his work, I would strongly recommend it to you. I'm sure some of you know Jed. He's, he's also a very colorful and forceful personality. Um, yeah, but he's, he's got a great website called blendedvalue.org. And there's a, just a huge set of resources there. Okay. Um, this is another of Jed's slides. Um, and it's just to illustrate a very simple point, which is we know that there's a light spectrum which is massive. You know, kind of... Um, uh, and, and we, with our eyes, can only see a tiny proportion of the light spectrum that now with the instrumentation that we have, we can measure and measure very accurately. And that's kind of where we are with respect to value. And we are looking historically and today mainly at value through the lens of economics uh, because that's the tool that we have. And the last couple of decades have been about trying to build better tools to get beyond the narrow financial metrics uh, to see full value. The other, uh, the other image I like to convey this point, um, uh, and I was scrambling for it, I couldn't find it for these slides, is that I saw in a cartoon once of a, uh, a drunkard looking under a lamppost for his car keys. Um, and that's at night. And that's pretty much where we've been uh, with respect to social impact. You know, we're looking where the light is, uh, shining, and not where we may have left our keys. Okay. So there's a long history here, and um, for people who've been around a long time and uh, we get onto these topics, I sometimes talk to senior evaluators who are kind of 30, 40 years in the evaluation field, and they're a little jaded because a lot of the ideas that we're talking about today and are excited about have actually been around for a long time, and I think that's a really important point. A lot of the ways to measure the ways organizations can come, can manage themselves to work to impact have been around a long time. And the central question, and the one I really want to come to in the in the interactive part of this conversation, give you guys a chance to, to ask your questions and make some comments, is why aren't we uh, doing a better job with it? So um, you could go back way earlier than the 80s, and I'm not going to talk to all these points. Um, you could go back to the 50s and the kind of development of professional management practice in the business world and in government and look at the way management in the social change space, in the nonprofit space, if you will, where I've spent most of my life, has been evolving. And an interesting little side note about the nonprofit sector for many countries, it's the sector that's producing the second or third highest rate of new jobs. Um, and in some countries, it's the highest rate of new jobs. It's a kind of a growth area. And the management in social change is a kind of emerging field and is gaining speed. And me measurement is a subset of all that. So three, three points I want to make about um, this kind of historical progression. And, and um, the first one is illustrated by the image underneath this, which is a ridge line um, uh, and a mountain range. And the point that we're, we're making about the ridge line is that where organizations have been sitting independently for a long time, figuring out systems because they need them to work. Um, and there have been millions of, of paths, or as someone wrote a book recently, kind of um, billions of drops in millions of buckets. There's no, uh, there's no kind of common 
approach. And so when you can get up onto the ridge line, you can start to see where the common trends are, are starting to, uh, to, uh, to be visible. And it's really seen in a great historical convergence between the social sector, the nonprofit sector, and the business sector. And what's emerging in the world today is creating confusion and contradiction. And we have trouble with vocabulary and language because the kind of investment metrics and language doesn't quite work, work right. When you talk about social change and the way social activists talk about things don't really compute for investors. Um, and we're kind of starting to find some new vocabulary that's blending the two. I think something's emerging like a kind of a, I want to call it the business social sector. And we're in this hybridization moment, and that's kind of where we are, and I'm excited about what it's going to produce. One of the things that uh, it's producing is breakthroughs in shared measurement practices. These are just beginning, and I think they're going to gain steam and become the future in a major way. A very good report was written last year by a nonprofit consulting firm that specializes in evaluation in the U.S. called the Foundation Strategy Group, or uh, FSG Impact, they renamed themselves. On this topic, I recommend the report, but the takeaway from it is that they found three categories of shared measurement practices. The first was, <coughs> was um, folks that are starting to develop common indicators, common uh, ways to describe in, uh, activities and outcomes. Um, the second uh, kind of level, it's kind of, a, it's kind of a, a, a hierarchy moving up. The second level is people start to actually then compare performance across organizations. And they can be very diverse organizations because you're, you're comparing against um, uh, underlying common factors. And I'll say more about that in a minute. And the third highest where the telos of this is going, where it's taking us, is to adaptive management, to adaptive learning, to where we are together starting to uh, interrogate the, the data, the evidence of change, and then learning together uh, more effectively about what works. So there's a huge enabler to all this, and I don't think a lot of what's going on in the world now would be happening without the internet and without the new, digi new digital communications more broadly. And it's allowed us to work from centuries of social change by discourse to now starting to have data. And I wouldn't say we're yet um, making most decisions in organizations by the evidence and data that we have, because we've still got this lag where we're mostly doing it on the basis of, days, you know, of discourse, of, of, of fundraising pitches and anecdotes and, and charisma, rather than on the hard data. But we're starting to now assemble the data, and it's going to become increasingly difficult to ignore and through different techniques. So people are, are, are using in the evaluation space, people are starting to use scientific methods like randomized control trials to demonstrate cause and effect in a very powerful way around large uh, scale interventions. Like, um, you probably all heard the deworming story, and the fact that it's the, one of the, the, it's proven now as, the, as clearly a low cost way to bring millions and millions of children into school, which is by providing free and universal deworming medicine at 50 cents a person. We've got randomized control trials now from several settings that make this indisputable, and slowly, the people who are allocating resources will begin to respond to that kind of data. Um, so this is my second big point about what's coming, the shift from discourse to data. Um, and um, uh, there's three kinds of things that are happening with the data that really excite me uh, in the internet. The first is we're starting to, to code and tag uh, and describe in accurate ways that are measurable and aggregatable the actual flows of money, what the money is going for, what people are doing. You can't actually push a button today and say how much money is flowing into a particular approach toward preventing HIV AIDS in any country in the world. But we're getting close to the point where that's happening. So there's an initiative called the International Accountability and Transparency Initiative, which is a big donor, public donor initiative, which is attempting to put that coding in place, at least for public aid. And I, I think within a couple of years we're going to have it, and within five years we're going to be able to push that button and see exactly where money is flowing, both what it, where, it, where it lands and how it flows down all the way through the communities. So that's the coding thing. The second is this shared metrics thing, which I mentioned in the, in the last slide, um, that by enabling um, people to put data uh, and about outcomes onto web platforms that everybody can see, 
uh, we can begin to kind of aggregate and learn around uh, those outcomes. And then the third one is um, we can start, to, we have now, it's now much easier to conduct surveys and to get information from the people who are meant to benefit. And this is where we start to segue into the part of the, of the, uh, of the talk that I was really called up here to do. Because our work is all about, if you will, accountability-oriented approaches toward measurement. And um, with new digital technologies, it becomes very easy to get the views of millions of people very inexpensively. So you don't have to send out um, people in white coats and clipboards to go conduct interviews. You can actually use cell phones and SMS, and you can get phenomenal amounts of data coming back about the performance of of uh, nonprofit programs, public services, and the like. And this is coming. There's a whole wave and explosion around what are called social accountability mechanisms around the world, which is simply a form of measuring public services, letting citizens organize to measure public services. And then we're starting to figure out how to organize that data in ways that decision makers can, can respond to it. So three big things that are happening. Um, um, you may, some of you may have heard of, a, I want to give a shout out for a, a technology called uh, Frontline SMS. Frontline SMS is a free shareware program that you can download. It's been used very effectively by an organization that was started here called Ushahidi, which has applied it very well most recently in Haiti, where it allows people, you set up a, 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 a number, and people can text to that number, and the data is then aggregated onto a laptop, and it literally is... Uh, all it requires to do it is a laptop, a cell phone, a USB cable, and, um, and you're done. You're off and running. You create a very powerful database of, of input that comes in through the, uh, through the SMS numbers. Okay. Um, so I want to step back now a little bit from some of the stuff that's happening in the measurement space um, and uh, the innovations and the new tools that we have and talk about social change. So when we started this process at Keystone, um, we asked ourselves, okay, look, there's a whole lot of buzz around measurement, but we know from history that most, mostly what happens is that um, the donors impose metric, metrics models. Uh, people who are receiving the money go through the motions to get the money, but it doesn't really tie in to uh, performance and what matters on the ground, and the disjunction is never fixed. And we don't want to be part of that. We just, at Keystone, we don't want to be part of that recreation of that paradigm that's been going on for decades. So what is it that really matters? What is it that we really should be measuring? Uh, knowing that if, you, if there's a hundred things out there that would be good to measure, there's only four or five that are actually going to drive the needle on the problem, and you're only going to get to those four or five anyway. And so we've struggled to get to those. And this is kind of where we came out after two or three years of working on this and talking to everybody we could about it. It's what we call our four cardinal principles of social change. Um, and the first one, um, which is uh, in the middle there, which is clarify your purpose and map your outcomes, I think was absolutely brilliantly illustrated by Penelope's uh, presentation. That was a crystal clear articulation of the theory of change. Uh, and it would be very easy to take the next step having listened to her. I think any of us could sit and write down a number of indicators on a timeline that would tell you whether she's hitting her theory of change with the work that they're doing. I have to say that 95% of the social change organizations out there cannot do that. And so that's the first job. They're, they do not have clear theories of change. And if you want to test me on that, take any nonprofit group that you like, that you know, Sit them down, four or five of the staff, don't just do the one, you have to get a group, and ask them to, to give you their core, just tell them to give you a core mission statement, let alone a full theory of change. It's, uh, and I mean beyond the, whatever the official line is, and you'll see what I mean. The second uh, principle is stand in the ecosystem, not the organization. So we cannot solve important societal problems alone. It's a truism, it's trite, we all know that. And so, uh, and yes, we stand for the most part in our organizations and our metrics models are built around our organizations. We've got to lift them up and move them into the ecosystem. We need system level measurement or problem system level measurement, not organization level measurement. We need the organizational level measurement as well, but it has to tie into the system. So that's principle two. Principle three is um, what I call the feedback principle of 
um, social change. And this speaks to the first slide when we have the long list of all the different actors who stand around any problem. And it's a representation of what happens when you think about reporting and public reporting for social change from a system level. I'm an individual organization. I want to report about social change and, my, and the work that I do, but I want it to really reflect the system problem. So what I do is, I measure my results in whatever way and approach is right for my organization. And we could talk about the technical sides of measurement and what, what's right for an individual organization, we will. But, um, but when I come to reporting on those measurements, on my results and what my organization is achieving, the, before I do that, I should go out and talk to the people who are meant to benefit from the work that I'm doing and ask them what they think about my story, about the way I'm helping them. And then to publish both my results and what they think about my results. And by doing that, what you're doing is you're making learning about results the key thing that's happening in your, in your public reporting. So it's really kind of a theory of public reporting that I'm coming to here that is very underdeveloped in the social change space. We're not using that uh, to the extent that we could. Hence the need for the feedback principle. And the last point is the one that swings across and flows through all of them, which is foster constituency voice. And when I say constituency voice, what I mean by that is um, not is is a very strong accountability to the people who are meant to benefit and all the constituents around the problem. And you can realize that accountability through the feedback principle by talking about your results, but also engaging with people at planning stage and an implementation stage. And what, what I'm saying most importantly about constituency voice is measure it. Don't just do it, don't just live it, but actually measure it. Measure how well you're doing at constituency voice and, um, and publish that. Which brings me to my dashboard and what Keystone is kind of adding to the story about impact and the piece that I hope you take away today, which is that Historically, people have worked on two buckets of measurement. The first one was performance, and this is where the business world is fantastic, and we're learning a ton about how to improve our efficiency in the nonprofit sector from business management, and, it, and more of that, a lot more of that needs to happen. The second area, which is what I've been talking about mostly, is starting to get an impact. What are the real results? And trying to measure that in a smart way. And there's been some movement, the movement from measuring activities to measuring outcomes, to seeing what the change is, and, and, and all of that. And that's great and important, and it must go on. The third bucket is not there for most organizations, and that's the one we need. And that's the one that is equally important, to my view, with the other two, and it's amazing to me that it's missing, which is the quality of relationships. So if you ask yourself, what is it that makes an, a, 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 a something succeed or fail in social change? it almost inevitably falls back to the quality of the relationships among the actors who are trying to make the change. And yet, that's not something that we're historically measuring. So, um, we have an analog for this. And that's customer satisfaction in the business world. So in 1950, uh, in the 1950s, customer satisfaction industry didn't exist. Market research existed, but market researchers weren't focusing on customer satisfaction. The customer satisfaction industry has grown up from the late 60s to today. If, we asked, if I asked a group of like you in 1962, how many of you have filled out a customer satisfaction form, no one would raise their hand. If I asked that same question today right here, how many of you filled out a form in the last month, I, virtually every hand in the room would go up, I suspect. So, am I right? Okay. So, um, this industry came out of uh, out of, of uh, it, interesting, it's another story, but it actually came out of the social movement, which was the consumer rights movement. Um, and that's a, that puts an interesting question for how we're going to get to where we need to get to in social change. But I'm not going to get into that now um, in this conversation, but I'm happy to chat about that. Um, but what we know now from business is that customer loyalty properly measured is an incredible indicator of growth, profits, and shareholder value. Maybe the best predictor we have. And I would, our hypothesis at Keystone is that the quality of relationships around social change interventions is the best predictor we have. We're just not measuring it yet and working with it. So we're trying to prove that uh, now in our work. And the way we're doing that is through comparative feedback surveys. 
So we're starting to run these. We look for cohorts of like organizations that are ready to allow themselves to be compared against each other in terms of feedback from their primary constituents. And we ran one here in, in East Africa last year with nine local grant-making institutions across East Africa. And we went out and we surveyed all of their, um, their grantees, 350 grantees, mostly community-based groups, to get them to speak about um, the performance and relationship they had with their grant makers. It was anonymous, so we could get truth to power like data. But even in an anonymous setting, people are gonna bias their feedback because they're talking about a funder. It's an important relationship to them. They don't wanna risk it even under anonymous cloak. And so you, when you do individual surveys, you, you're not picking up the bias. The bias is there, but you don't know how to read it. When you do a comparative survey across like organizations, you can actually filter out the bias. Because if everyone's giving you 5.7, your average is a 5.7 on a six point scale, say for a closed question, you think that's pretty good, 5.7 is great, I'm doing fine. And then you see that amongst your nine colleagues, 5.7 is actually bottom of the class. And everybody else is at 5.8, 5.9. So all of a sudden, zero to 5.8, you realize is the bias. And 5.8 to, to 6.0, uh, that's, the, that's, the, that's the real scale. And so we're running these surveys now where we look for like organizations and we do this according, uh, on a number of dimensions and true to our, our, uh, our ideology, if you will, we develop these questionnaires with the participants around the things that matter in that relationship that matter to the impact they're trying to achieve and we basically interrogate those questions. We're running one right now, it's open and we're recruiting. I should advertise for it and I have a brochure for it in the space of social investing. We want to do the thing, same thing for social investment funds that we've done for um, grant makers in East Africa. Go out and talk to their social investees about the performance of those funds. So if anybody knows of any of those that should be part of our survey, please let me know. So it's one of the, the new tools that we're, we're using um, and, and, and how we do that. Okay, so enough. Uh, of the kind of uh, talking head up here and um, there'll be some time at the end for questions and um, ex explore aspects of this that I've covered too superficially or made a hash of um, and uh, I look forward to that because you can't get this stuff right in a presentation. It can only come right through a conversation. Um, and so now I'd like to open it up with a little conversation. As I said, we've um, We've primed a few people in the audience, a uh, few of the YGLs, to kind of share some of their experiences around this, with an emphasis around the challenge of doing it. And my kind of, my kind of question here is, is um, so if this is so important and it's so useful, um, why aren't we doing more of it? Why don't we have uh, metrics in the social change space equivalent to the kind of metrics uh, that we have in the business space? So maybe I could start with Siobhan. Siobhan, would you uh, be willing to give us a, where are you? There you are. I think this, this is a huge uh, issue for um, nonprofit organizations. When you say, why are we not doing it? I mean, one of the biggest challenges that we face is we're constantly dealing with donors uh, applying for funding and they'll give you a year, maybe a year and a half, two years at max to implement a program. And you know, you're, you're talking about impact. Impact is different uh, in terms of outcomes. I mean, if you're trying to tackle the issue of uh, illiteracy or education, part of the solution is, uh, okay, building schools, making sure you get kids into school. Um, but that's, that's only part of it. And so much of the time, that's as far as you get with donors, because guess what? I mean, I was just talking with my colleague uh, James here, who's mm -hmm. a country director in Tanzania. You have to meet the deadline of getting the donor report in, and guess what? That school has to be built, and, and that's as far as it, it goes. So I think donors um, are the people we need to focus on a little bit here, because I think the, the NGOs themselves are, are doing a lot in terms of trying to consult with communities. I mean, I'll give you an example. Again, there's a, we find out there's a deadline for uh, an application for a million dollars to build schools. The amount of time we should spend talking with the communities, planning with them, um, asking them what their needs are, 
I mean, there's very little time for that, and the NGOs have to take on that responsibility themselves uh, to do that. Um, and also, the donors never ask us to include communities in, in terms of our evaluations afterwards. Um, did we actually meet the needs of the communities? Did we actually um, fulfill their needs? Uh, we're never asked that, and that's left up to the NGOs themselves. I think you're a little unfair in terms of saying there are not that many NGOs uh, doing that. I think there are a lot more uh, people actually that, and organizations asking that question internally and basically saying, well, if the donors don't want it, we're going to do it anyway because accountability to communities uh, is critically important. So, you know, I, I think that's one of the areas we really have to focus on. We have to talk to donors because they control uh, so much, we can't do anything without the funding. So, I think that's one good place to start. That's great. Thank, thank you, Siobhan. So that's, um, and I, I take the, uh, I take, I'm chastened. Uh, it's true. There is a lot of stuff going on internally. I did a, an, a year-long action learning uh, research project with human service organizations in the United States, asking them about their accountability to beneficiaries and how they learn from their beneficiaries. And um, what they told me was what you just said. We actually run two systems. We run the system for the donors, and we run the system internally uh, to get at the questions that are really important to us. And this is hugely inefficient. We've got to stop this. And, that, and as long as people are doing that, they're not going to get as far as they could with proper unified metrics model. And you've got to bring the donors into the story, which is incidentally why in our comparative feedback work, you notice I gave two examples, one with investees giving feedback to investors and one with grantees giving feedback to grant makers. And in both cases, we're not talking to the people on the ground who are meant to benefit from the work, which is where we at Keystone would like to be. We'd like to be farther down that feedback value chain, as I call it, uh, right down at the ground. But we can't be because uh, farther up the value chain, the donors don't yet get it. And so. I, I'm, I'm with you, but let's let's maybe shift and not to create uh, uh, polarity, but let's maybe shift and get a, a funder perspective on this. Shamina, are you here? I saw her get up at one point, and I, and I wonder if I know she came back. Okay, well, that's uh, we were not going to have the the donor rebuttal, I'm afraid. Shamina works with, with uh, Citibank, and in, unless there's somebody, yeah, back here. I am voiceless in the uh, United States. Uh, I consider myself a social capitalist, but also a philanthropist. And I hope that it's a counterpoint, but it's more than anything, it's really what goes back to the root of, of, or I would say the context and history of philanthropy. So as an investor, as a private sector investor, it's very easy for me to understand, hey, it's about profit, it's about traction, or we care about this particular type of technology, and at some point our investments, we grow them, we sell them, we take an IPO, we merge them, and it's about that context, it's about the ecosystem. On the opposite side, philanthropy for, for centuries now really gets down to what are the things that I, as an individual, care about? and not necessarily the ecosystem. So if I, if, if I were a true donor and I were true to the cost, I would go to the community and I would say, what does the community need, not what do I want to do for the community? And I think it's just more as a philosophical question until, <coughs> until donors, until we get to really understand that true philanthropy really comes to making a contribution and oftentimes not doing what you want to do, but what is actually needed. Until we really get to that, it's going to be very difficult to move that type of metric from that you see and is so far from the private sector and the business world into the uh, social world. But it, it is possible, and as donors get to understand that real impact is not going to happen, that volcano is not going to really get to happen until you really coalesce and get a lot of uh, other donors investees, grantees into the pool, uh, that, that real change is not going to come to place. I think that that mindset will ultimately uh, adjust. That's a great point. In all the uh, survey data of uh, philanthropists, the surveying of givers uh, supports what you just said very strongly. But it's also, we're starting to see a little shift around that. And um, I remember a story that uh, 
the, uh, a South African judge told me in the 1980s. I worked at the Ford Foundation and we, we were funding basically the human rights uh, uh, activities in South Africa and funding the liberation struggle process. And we did something fairly controversial. We sent a white South African seated judge under the apartheid system to an international human rights seminar that the Aspen Institute was holding. And uh, it was quite controversial at the time and a number of the judges were upset about it. Then they sat with this judge and they talked to him and they found that he was really open and he was ready to do things differently. He went back to South Africa and he, a couple years later he started making some really important human rights decisions in the courts. They were subsequently overturned by parliament, but nevertheless he did it in the courts. Um, I then asked him a couple years later in my kind of grant maker trying to take credit for something we caused, I said, so was it us sending you to the, to the seminar that really opened you up to do these things? He looked at him and he said, no, David, nothing to do with that. I actually want to be doing do those cases forever. But up until recently, there were no lawyers making the argument. I can't, I can't decide a case on, on uh, arguments, not in evidence. So I think it's both sides. And we, in the social, on the social entrepreneur side, need to be putting out a better case, a more persuasive case for how to measure change. Um, that the investors can then respond to. Um, so uh, I want to turn now and ask um, Paul Van Sale. Paul, where are you? You here? So Paul's got a tough measurement problem. Um, uh, will, will you tell us a bit about that and how you deal with it? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so one of the things that I think is important to think about when you talk about impact is there's a, there's a rigor and a discipline to it, and I think David's done a fantastic job in uh, getting us to focus on it, and I'll speak a little bit about it. But I also think there's a, a conviction and a passion part of it. So, um, I work for the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and on the first day of our, uh, of our work, Nelson Mandela called